Previously we showed that SpaceX's long-awaited Mars mission was way off target. While the gigantic rocket they were proposing to build could theoretically lift the Dragon spacecraft with a radiation shelter module and crew habitat, Elon Musk instead opted for a 100 crew expedition to Mars with the only protection from radiation being to point a column of water towards the sun. You, you need to have some shielding, particularly if there's a solar flare um, or, or sort of a big, uh, it's any kind of sort of solar storm, you, we'd want to basically point the rocket at the, at the sun and, and maximize your shielding effect. Um, at, you know, point the rear of the rocket at the sun so you maximize your shielding effect and, and have the passengers cluster around a, a column of water. Um, but I think the radiation risk there is, is relatively small. It seems that Musk still hasn't figured out that his column of water must completely surround the crew. Because as demonstrated by the January 27, 2012 solar proton event, solar flares are not directional. The sun's magnetic field deflects the solar particles in all directions, even if the flare was initially pointed away from the Earth, and thus, protection from all directions is a necessity. Well, it seems SpaceX has set themselves up to lose a crew to space radiation yet again. On February 27, 2017, SpaceX posted the following announcement on their website. We are excited to announce that SpaceX has been approached to fly two private citizens on a trip around the moon late next year. They have already paid a significant deposit to do a moon mission. And before anyone asks, no, I am not among those two private citizens. As of my producing this video, my Fly Jarrett to the Moon fundraise has only accumulated a total of $722.25 US. The significant deposit that the tourists paid has not been announced. But with the $500,000 price tag still way off into the future, it's rumored that the tourists paid about $45 million US dollars each. SpaceX, the private rocket company, can take you where no tourist has gone before for an astronomical price, roughly $45 million. This $45 million price tag seems to stem from the fact that the Falcon Heavy will cost $90 million per launch. Which brings me to the next point of contention. The announcement goes on to say, Most importantly, we would like to thank NASA, without whom this would not be possible. NASA's commercial crew program, which provided most of the funding for the Dragon 2 development, is the key enabler for this mission. In addition, this will make use of the Falcon Heavy rocket, which was developed with internal SpaceX funding. The article then goes on to specify that the flight will see the Dragon circumnavigate the Moon and return to Earth, implying that it is merely a flyby around the far side of the Moon and back again without entering orbit. Where do I begin with this? Let's address the obvious. Firstly, I have no doubt that the Falcon 9 Heavy is capable of sending the Dragon spacecraft to the Moon, there have even been proposals to send unmanned dragons to the Moon and Mars using this rocket. But the Falcon 9 Heavy hasn't even flown yet, and it's not scheduled to launch for at least a few more months at the earliest. And that's just to test fly it. Judging by the launch manifest, there is only one Department of Defense satellite launch scheduled between its maiden flight and this lunar tourism flight. That doesn't sound like enough time to man rate the launch vehicle. By comparison, we are now quite used to seeing videos of the Falcon 9 taking off and returning to the Earth. That's become the norm. But let's remember that the latest successful landing is a culmination of 30 separate launches between 2010 and 2017. During such time, they've had one in-flight failure, one pad explosion, and five failed landings of the first stage booster. And yet, after nearly a decade of trial and error, SpaceX still have not yet man-rated the Falcon 9. Now they're talking about strapping on two additional first stages as side boosters and sending humans to the moon after only two previous launches over a one-year period. Optimistic to say the least. Even if SpaceX can get the Falcon Heavy ready in time, there is still the matter of shielding the astronauts from the radiation. Some SpaceX fans who followed my videos asked why my theory for manned Red Dragon missions to the Moon and Mars required a shelter module surrounded by two meters of water despite the Apollo missions not using one. The truth of the matter is, even if you take Apollo moon landing hoax conspiracy theories out of the equation, any manned deep space mission involving the Dragon is going to require such a shelter. Why? Simple. The Dragon shield rating is minuscule compared to what is used nowadays on the ISS or even back during the Apollo days. 
I could not find the technical specifications for the Dragon V2, but according to this report on Dragon V1, the total equivalent thickness of the aluminium pressure section and thermal protection shield material is 200 mils aluminium equivalent thickness. 200 mils is equivalent to 0 0.508 centimeters. So if we multiply that by the density of aluminium, we find the Dragon is rated at only 1.4 grams per square centimeter. The Dragon V2 is similar in size and mass to the Dragon V1, so it is a safe bet that it probably hasn't had much of a shielding upgrade, if at all. This diagram by J. W. Kellerichdahl, 1963, of the Marshall Space Flight Center, blots the attenuating ability of various materials against protons of varying energy. From this we can clearly see that 1.4 grams per square centimeter of aluminium will stop all protons with energies up to about 3 mega electron volts. To put that into perspective, the inner Van Allen belt is composed predominantly of protons with energies all the way up to 400 mega electron volts. Such protons are in the same energy range as those used in proton therapy. For example, a 200 mega electron volt proton will penetrate up to 25.8 centimeters of soft human flesh and a 250 MeV proton will be attenuated by 37.7 centimeters of soft human flesh. But unlike proton therapy, in which the protons are in a controlled environment and directed through a tiny beam targeting the cancer in question, in the Van Allen radiation belt, the astronaut's entire body is exposed, and most of the protons will be stopped within their body. The industry standard model for the Van Allen fluxes are the AP8 and AE8 models. The former covers protons and the latter covers electrons, and lists them as a function of magnetic shell, or L values, and magnetic field strength, or B over B0 values. Together they are collectively referred to as the AX8. But despite being regarded as the Bible for Van Allen fluxes, in recent times it has become apparent that the AX8 is extremely compromised, fails to take into consideration the dynamics of the Van Allen belts, and has become notorious for underestimating the proton fluxes. This graph, for example, shows that for a 29 degree inclination orbit of 690 kilometers altitude, the AP8 is off by a factor of at least 3. This correction factor will become important shortly. Since we know that the Dragon can only shield against protons with energies up to 3 MeV, we can use the coordinates that have been attributed to Apollo 11, plug them into the AP8 max, and get a theoretical estimate of what the tourists will receive should they follow this trajectory aboard Dragon. Using this interval as an example, we see that there are about 42,003 MeV protons per square centimeter per second. If you've been following my videos, you probably already know the drill by now. Convert the flux to particles per square meter per hour, multiply by the surface area to find the hourly proton hit rate, multiply by the energy of each proton, then convert from MeV to joules. To find the absorbed dose, we divide by the mass to get grays per hour. This will depend on whether we're considering the skin or body doses. Then we convert from grays to rads, and finally we divide by 60 to find out how much radiation was absorbed within the first minute. From this we see that the three MeV protons within this minute of transit would have delivered about 0.5 rad to the skin and 0.03 rad to the body. I repeated the calculations for all the protons with energies between 3 MeV and 7 MeV for each minute of transit and compiled them within this table. We see that the total radiation absorbed for the outbound trajectory is 9 rad for the skin and a body dose of 0.65 rad. I already calculated the doses for 8 to 400 MeV protons in a previous video. I added the two totals together and came up with this table. Now the doses are 86 rad for the skin and about 4 rads for the body. The dose received from the return trip is about two-fifths of the first trip. So the total skin and body doses from both trips through the belt is 121 rad and 6.7 rad respectively. That may not sound like much, but we're not done yet. All types of radiation have a weight factor, or Q factor, that the absorbed dose needs to be multiplied by to convert to the equivalent dose. For protons greater than 2 MeV, the Q factor is between 2 and 5. And as we saw in my previous video, for solar protons, such as those trapped in the Van Allen belt, a Q factor of 5 seems to be the magic number, as it was most consistent with the doses E.E. E. Kovalev estimated for his selection of 30 MeV proton flares. And as stated previously, 
we need to further multiply this dose by the correction factor of 3 to account for the APH shortcomings and underpredictions. Without the correction factor, the proton equivalent dose ends up being over 600 rad for the skin and 34 rad for the body. With the correction factor, the skin and body doses are over 1800 rad and 101 rad respectively. 1800 rad to the skin is enough to cause severe burns and reddening, and anything on the order of 100 rad to the body within any short time is enough to cause potentially life-threatening radiation illness. James Van Allen himself once wrote that a dose of only 10 rentgens over two days gives a 50-50 chance of survival. Well, this body dose is equivalent to 115 rentgens. That's what's going to happen to the tourists if they take off on the Apollo 11 trajectory in the Dragon spacecraft. So how do we fix this? Well, the Interplanetary Transport System launch vehicle is still quite a few years away. And to supply the Dragon with a shelter module would push it well above the Falcon Heavy's lifting capacity to even low Earth orbit. However, I believe I have the answer to this problem. As stated in my previous video, the radiation levels become negligible at latitudes beyond a 60 degrees north or south of the geographical equator, or inclined to the geomagnetic pole by about 20 degrees. This is where the radiation belt stops, what James Van Allen called cones of escape. As he proposed back in 1959 and 1961, the best option would be to launch through this radiation-free zone over the poles. The simplest way would be to launch from the Arctic. Launched from Florida, the Dragon would need to alter its orbit over several days before finally becoming inclined by, say, 70 degrees. The translunar injection burn should then send the craft through the cones of escape. That takes care of the radiation belt, now we've got to deal with the solar flares and cosmic rays. The answer seems to be all in the timing. Research by Erica Harnett and Robert Wingley suggests that the ideal time to send a man to the moon is during the time that it is full. The Earth has a magnetic field that protects us from the bulk of the solar radiation and all but the highest energy cosmic rays. The side of the magnetic field facing the Sun extends to 65,000 kilometers. The far side of the magnetic field is blown backwards by the solar wind, creating a tail that extends well over 6 million kilometers far beyond the orbit of the moon. I think you can see where this is going. During the full moon, the moon itself passes through the magneto tail and receives the same protection from solar flares and cosmic rays that the Earth receives. In a sense, the entire moon has become shielded. This goes on for seven days until the moon moves back outside the tail to continue along its orbit, again receiving the full abuse of the unrelenting sun. This provides a seven-day window in which astronauts could make a trip to the moon and back again without any fear of solar flares. As Erica Harnett wrote in her paper, Missions transferring astronauts between the Earth and the moon and extended missions on the surface of the moon could be planned for times when the moon is within the magnetosphere and the radiation hazards may be minimized. And so, the solution to sending man around the moon aboard the Dragon, launched by the Falcon Heavy, is a no-brainer. Launch the Dragon on an outbound and inbound trajectory of 70 degrees north or south of the Earth's geographic equator to take the Dragon through Van Allen's Cones of Escape, and time said mission to coincide with the full moon so tourists can take full advantage of the magnetic tail. Some have speculated that the mission is intended to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 8. Well, how fortuitous. It seems the moon will be full, or at least almost full, during the week of the anniversary. It is my fear that if SpaceX does not take immediate steps to incorporate the methods that I just described, they stand in danger of losing two people to the Van Allen radiation belt and whatever solar flares they may encounter. People are encouraged to mirror this video and share it with Elon Musk, but as demonstrated by my SpaceX Man on Mars videos, producing these videos and sending the links to Elon Musk is not enough. I did everything in my power to reach out to him, explaining that his column of water pointed to the sun is not going to protect astronauts on a flight to Mars. But my warnings fell on deaf ears. The only way to get him to listen is to, well, purchase a ride off him. Since the Dragon is intended to carry seven people and only two tourists have signed up, that means that there must be at least four empty seats available, assuming that they have a pilot and the flight is not remote controlled. 
Since we're still a long way away from flights to space costing $500,000 per person, it is fair to say that these tickets will be $45 million each. If you value human life and don't want to see two civilians die in space, I plead you to donate towards my Fly Jarrah to the Moon fundraise. This is no longer a mission to prove whether or not the radiation is survivable, or if the Apollo missions were real or not. It is a rescue operation. If I can get a ticket on that flight with the two tourists, I will be able to get in touch with Elon Musk and his mission planners directly. I will help them steer the mission onto a more survivable path. I will ensure that the mission departs through the cones of escape over the radiation-free polar regions. I will ensure that the mission coincides with the full moon so that we can take full advantage of the natural protection offered by the Magneto Tail. And ultimately, when I return, I will see that SpaceX rectifies the shortcomings with their proposed Mars missions, ensure that a 2 meter water shield completely surrounding the crew can be used on future missions. I have plans that will help SpaceX reach their fullest potential and ultimately lead us into the cosmos.